my team happy thursday very welcome to the ravit show i am super happy to have emmanuel bragin and tim kraska as my guest on the ravit show today they are both founders of nblake analytics a uh, brown mit spin off there uh, the company is developing a novel technique called data boards to make data science more interactive and team oriented nblake is based uh, on a multi year research project which won many awards and was widely featured in the news including an article in the science magazine a uh, little about our guest today tim is an associate professor of electrical engineering and computer science in mit's computer science and artificial laboratory co director of the data system and ai lab at mit and co founder of uh, endlick analytics so many feathers to its hat uh, uh, definitely would love to more, know more about tim a uh, little about emmanuel uh, prior to founding enblick in 2019 emmanuel was a postdoc in the database group at mit and got his phd in computer science from brown university during his time he worked on various interactive tools for visual data exploration and analysis most of them either influenced or are direct predecessors of uh, enblick such as wisdom that won the vldb best demo award in 2015 so a lot to know more about and i'm sure if we get a chance will definitely ask emmanuel to uh, give us a short demo to or maybe a touch base on that uh, also in his previous non academic life emmanuel was worked as a software engineer and dba for various financial companies in zurich and tried his luck as a freelancer building in studio touch screen installation for swiss national tv before <laughs> jeff han and cnn made it cool so uh definitely talking more about that and developing a spotify clone for swiss market which uh, he says failed miserably <laughs> so obviously we have a lot of things that we can talk about today um uh, also i can see obviously a few folks joining us kostup thanks for joining yeah definitely looking for this amazing learning session i know for for a fact where tim and emmanuel have done a lot for the data science and data community as a whole so would love to you know learn more about it but to just give you guys a quick uh, you know obviously with the ravit show we always give away something and uh, endlick has been super kind to give away a 75% off on their pro tier what you just need to do is okay let me share maybe this screen so you just need to type in hashtag #endlick in the chat and you will enter the raffle we'll choose at least let's say we have two guests so we'll choose two winners uh, towards the end of the show and we'll get the ball rolling also uh, to let you guys know today we'll be discussing about data science for all collaborations and code optional so basically low code no code is also a great topic today so feel free to have your questions coming for us and uh, i'm sure our guest would be super happy to take them let's not make our guest wait any more here we go hey tim hey manuel welcome to the ravit show hey ravit good hey, to see ravit. you amazing such i was just uh, first of all such amazing uh, work that you've done in your past and now with enblick i know for a fact that uh, you guys are doing great things around for the community and it's more on the on the side where you are making sure that it helps the data science community at a larger uh you know the goal the mission here is obviously to help the community and make sure that it is the data science is actually available for everyone but uh, obviously we'll get into those weeds and uh to start with why not introduce yourself maybe tim you can start first <laughs> sure uh as you mentioned before like uh, i'm a professor at mit yeah. and i mainly work in the intersection of like machine learning and systems so either build systems to make machine learning or data science easier or more recently leverage machine learning to improve the performance uh, of systems uh before MIT I was actually a professor at Brown and that is where I met Emmanuel amazing what about you Emmanuel yeah so you know my name is Emmanuel um currently CEO here at Iron Blake and you know as Tim mentioned that uh, we met at Brown University while where I was doing my my PhD uh my focus area was more human computer interaction and uh you know on like Tim who's more on the the systems the data science side um and then after my PhD you know kind of followed Tim to MIT uh where I was a postdoc in, in Tim's group for for uh, <laughs> almost 2 years amazing so looks like you both kind of come from very different backgrounds like Tim in 
victim is in systems and uh, machine learning and manual in uh, human computer interaction so how did it happen that you two started working together what's like the back story to it yeah let me maybe start out with, uh, there um so you know back at brown during my phd i was really interested in uh, sort of building novel systems that make it easier for people to to visualize data and sort of work over over large data sets in, in general um, right. and in particular you know at the time we uh, had a couple of these uh, new devices back then like these large interactive uh, touch screens uh, where you can use you know pen and touch to kind of manipulate the screen um, hmm. And I always thought it was would be super cool if you could to sort of do data analysis on those screens, right? Like have them in a in a meeting, and people can sort of work together on on data problems on there. Um, and you know, kind of while going down that path, you know, creating some prototypes there, you know, pretty quickly realized that uh, to kind of solve this problem, you know, completely, you also have to kind of rethink how you know you process the data. Uh, people want to do machine learning, so you know, kind of things that were not in my uh, expertise, uh, and so. Um, that's kind of, you know, how I, I got to meet Tim, you know, uh, showed him a demo of, of what I was working on, the early prototypes, and, and that's how we, we met. Okay, this is amazing. And uh, in terms of, you know, how, what was the, like, when did you guys actually think about the idea and Blake? Where did that come from? Um, like, so I said, like, Einblick was like actually based on a research project. So like when Emmanuel showed me this demo, like we, we said like, oh, this is like so cool and it could be so much more, right? Like the, the interface right. really, really impressive. And so as the first step at Brown, we actually then decided, okay, how can we push it? How can we make sure that the interface he developed actually stays interactive for a very large data sets? Or how can we make it happen that you can do more than just like create secret queries out of it? And so we integrated this like whole machine learning library in it, and then it became part of a big DARPA project, which was called D3M. And so we were developing this platform further, which was like back in the days named Nostar. Um, so this was really a pure research project, which became like bigger and bigger. Then I moved at some point to MIT. And during this like whole time, like at Brown as well as MIT, we always tried to have people actually use the platform, right? Um, and um, like over time, it became clear that like there's real value there. People want to use it, but they also required a lot of things which are not necessarily research anymore, like LDAP integrations or like, uh, you know, like certain functionality, which was like, yeah, we need to bring it into the platform, but um, they are not necessarily research questions anymore. And so that's like when at some point we actually decided to spin it out as a company and and that became Einblick. Okay, very interesting. In so, in terms of the, uh, I have a question in terms of the research project itself. Like, what are the key innovations of Nordstar, the research project, and now the Enblick company? So, how do you connect both of them, and what's like the, you know, maybe the intersection where you see that this is this is how we would want to proceed uh, ahead in the game. Yeah, maybe I can start with the research key innovations and then Emmanuel take it forward what we are now doing in the company. Um, so like it's the the key research innovations we had uh, like very from uh, the beginning was on one hand the interface. So we really thought like how can we leverage these like, large interactive devices like the Microsoft Surface Hub um, to create like a very new experience and how people interact with data. And then later it became also more about remote collaboration. So how can you do something similar in, in different locations and make right. it create an interface which makes it easy for um, like uh, non-data scientists, people who don't program every day to do very advanced analytics, right? And so we started with the interface and this was like mainly what Emmanuel was like really driving forward. Uh, Nice. And then based on that, we actually discovered that the system behind it also needs to change. And that was a very interesting like observation because normally like people like me start with the system design and the interface comes as an afterthought. Exactly. Uh, for Nostar, we did it the other way around. The interface was there first. Oh. And then we tried to figure out how does the system need to change to power it. Right? And so we developed like a very novel like backend for it, which we called like an uh, progressive approximation engine, which particularly ensures that everything you do on that platform, regardless of your data size, regardless of the operation, stays interactive. And then on top, we had to develop a whole range of new algorithms, mainly also to ensure interactivity. 
right? Um, and so this built like the foundation in Nostar, and then like um, like these three aspects still remain in Einblick, but like of course they are changing quickly. Um, yeah, no, I was about to say, you know, like I think the sort of core vision of the of those three aspects is still sort of uh, in the DNA of the company. Um, you know, kind mm. of the, the whole mission of making data science, you know, more accessible to to more people. Um, but obviously, you know, we spent a lot of time kind of taking the research prototypes that we had and, you know, kind of building everything around it to really make it into like a, a full fledged product and, you know, extending everything from, you know, better code integration. And we'll talk a little bit later about that, you know, this kind of code optional idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. This is very interesting. And I know for a fact where, you know, to be honest, I've been hosting this since almost close to two years now. And the most uh, interesting question that I always get, uh, even online, offline, is how to break into data science, or maybe how can you know? Can you suggest us a platform which is like, uh, you know, less codey because we are kind of not, we don't belong to the data science field. So I think this is something which kind of will answer a lot of questions for the folks today uh, as well. And uh, in terms of uh, you know, like. We've just got a comment from El year who says data science is my dream job. So exactly what I'm, you know, trying to say. It's kind of, you know, people want to get into it, but they're just not finding the right platform to get into it, or you know, uh, work on something where they don't have to get into a lot of uh, detailing, but they can still uh, get get the ball rolling for themselves. So yeah. it makes a lot of sense. Also, since we are talking about the interface, uh, Emmanuel Tim Muir, uh, do we have a chance, that, like? folks can actually uh, like can you give like a sneak peek to the uh, to our folks here uh, so that would yeah. be like super interesting no for sure um happy to to do that um just uh, you know as a quick comment here you know the the platform's free right so you know if you want to actually wow. try it out you can go to our website uh, try it out and then you know enter the raffle that you have to kind of you know get a, a pro version of it too but uh you know uh, if anybody's interested in, in playing with it then uh, you know just feel free to do that um amazing yeah, so let me maybe give you a quick couple minutes sort of overview of, of what's happening here um, in the platform. So, you know, as you can see, um, we have these, you know, canvases, um, you know, and if you're familiar with tools like a Figma or a Mural, um, these kind of, you know, uh, interactive whiteboard tools, um, the, the kind of key interaction is really similar, right? So you can zoom in, zoom out, kind of, you know, lay out things freely on, on this canvas and, and really take advantage of the, the 2D nature of it. Um, you know, what makes it different than the tools I just mentioned is that everything's sort of uh, centered around data. So, you know, super easy to add new data sets, uh, connect to SQL databases or wh wherever your data is at, or just upload a CSV file here in this simple example. Um, and then once, uh, you know, I have data in there, I can go on and explore it. So, you know, I just use drag and drop to drag out this table here, um, can look at this in, in uh, sort of a spreadsheet like view. Um, and then, you know, for I might be interested in this is like a, a marketing example data set where there's a, a flag at the end that tells us, you know, with this marketing campaign that we ran, how many people ended up accepting the promotion. Uh, I can use drag and drop to pull out a quick visualization of that to kind of see what the breakdown is there. Um, and then, you know, maybe I'm also interested in, you know, the age of customers um, because, you know, maybe my hypothesis is, you know, uh, people who are uh, of a different age, uh, different age group might be more or less likely to, yeah. to accept the promotion. And so I can start doing things like, you know, select people who accepted, use that as a filter to this age visualization um, and sort of really start building these sort of, you know, more complex queries or more complex uh, workflows uh, over the data. Um, big piece of the platform is uh, collaboration. So all these things you can share. Um, I, I can share it with one of my colleagues here, Paul. So if I send him the link here on, on Slack, perhaps see if he jumps in and kind of show off the collaboration feature there too. Um, but, you know, Everything I showed so far is kind of relatively straightforward, kind of slicing and dicing data visually, um, getting down to the right you know, subset of data you're interested in. Uh, but then we have this kind of concept of these operators, as we call them, that can help you solve more sort of complex machine learning or, or data science tasks. Um, so for example, the one thing that we can do or that we have is this automated machine learning operator. Um, you know, If I'm dragging this out, what I can do is I can go through this wizard here uh, it tells me, you know, we need some training data. So let me just add this data set that we looked at previously. Um, we can have a separate test data, but, you know, if we leave it empty, that's fine too. Uh, we can select, you know, what, what is the thing we want to predict um, and then, you know, figure out which variables to use. 
Uh, maybe I'll exclude a couple nice. here. Um, and then, you know, once I'm done with setting this up and, and actually run it, uh, you know, we'll basically go off and sort of automatically look for machine learning pipelines that are solving this problem. So, you know, very different use case here than the slicing and dicing, but sort of, you know, simple, uh, visually packaged uh, operators that help you solve uh, fairly complex uh, data science problems. And I see Paul is here. So, you know, you see this kind of multiplayer aspect of the platform. You know, I can see what, what Paul is looking at. Uh, yeah. I can go into this life mode here, uh, as we call it. Uh, and if we do that, you know, we have sort of built in audio and video uh, chat where we can wow. see. Hey, Paul. Hey, Emmanuel. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I'm, uh, you're actually live on the internet. I'm, uh, you know, with Ravit in his show and uh, giving a quick sneak peek of uh, the, uh, the platform here. Amazing. Okay, cool. Glad to meet everyone. Yeah. So, you know, just uh, maybe move a couple of things around so people can see that this actually work. You know, Paul's in New York wow. and Boston, and you're watching this from anywhere, really. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Um, yeah, I hope this kind of gives gives folks like a, a little bit of an overview. I mean, obviously, lots of other things you can do. Um, you can really make these these things relatively complex and really build like you know advanced uh, data science workflows. Um, and you yeah. know, have this, uh, notion of also bring, being able to bring in Python code anytime. So you know, supports a whole variety of different workflows. Wow. Cool. So let me switch over here. I'll uh, stop my share and. Uh, Go back to you guys here. Amazing. This is fantastic. Uh, I really like the live live stuff there because you can actually, I've rarely seen, you know, someone getting live uh, and doing the project together. So that's like a super cool feature. But thanks for like that sneak peek. Definitely giving it a shot. I've shared uh, the link with you guys in the chat as well. So it's like there's 14 day free trial. And also uh, Emmanuel and Tim have been kind to give like 75% on the pro tire. So go and get it. And uh, obviously to enter the raffle, what you need to do is just type in and Blake. Let me quickly share your, I think, don't get the spelling wrong otherwise you kind of <laughs> miss the opportunity and it's like the golden opportunity i might you know actually put in the chat as well so i get a, a chance to do that so this is what you need to type in the chat guys also i see a few questions coming in so emmanuel tim why not take a few questions from the audience here sure thing happy to yeah awesome so aditi here is asking something very interesting how can smart data be utilized in the finance field Interesting. Um, so, we, yeah, we actually have a, a couple of, uh, you know, uh, customers in the financial field. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think the platform is, is uh, you know, sort of dom domain independent, right? Like, I think a lot of the kind of standard data science workflows, you know, building forecasts or building predictive models or, you know, just looking and analyzing data or, you know, trying to compare two different groups of, of, of uh, data with, with each other, like a lot of these sort of standard data science tasks. Yeah, you know they're useful in any really any domain really, um, and uh, you know uh, I think that the platform lends itself well to sort of yeah be domain independent and just be able to work with any kind of uh, uh, data really. Okay, that's fantastic. So it's not limited to just any domain, but all of you know if, yeah come from any domain in and like is for you. So which is fantastic. Also, we have a few questions around and Blake. Um, Mike is your Mike. Thanks for joining us. And Blake, German for insight. My German is awesome. <laughs> that, that's, that's actually right. So like it, the name is very clever, but unfortunately only a few people with German backgrounds normally understand it. So if you write it together as Ein Blick, it means insight. If you write this two words like Ein Blick, it means one view. So very clever name, not nice. the easiest for uh, Americans and like other English speaking people, but at the same time, it's unique. Ein Blick. Yeah, definitely. And uh, that's like a follow up question from uh, someone in the audience. How did you come up with the name Ein Blick? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, uh, half of the, the co-founding team is, is German speaking, uh, including Tim and myself. Yeah, I grew up in Zurich in Switzerland. Nice. Um, so, you know, we kind of had the majority there to, to be able to, to pick a German name uh, amongst the <laughs> co-founders. <laughs> Amazing. So that's like the history of Enblick in terms of the name, but also uh, so Enblick is uh, obviously code optional platform. So what is your view on code versus no code? Because that's been like a super interesting topic since a few years now. I would love to hear your thoughts. Maybe Tim, you go first. Uh, sure. Like, uh, like I think in in the end, like 
no code enables that many more people can actually work with um, like with data science or do data science platforms, right? Like or work with data science problems. Um, the the downside of no code is if you have your pure no code platform is it's like only designed for those people. And if you know how to code a little bit, right? It's yeah. just like sometimes like the visual operators don't fit your mental model. Or if you have experience already, you know that how to do it in Python and maybe you don't want to learn a visual way to do it. So like actually our opinion is it should be code last. So you start with no code, which enables you very rapidly to develop something very quickly, mm -hmm. but you don't take the option away to write code when necessary. And like Emmanuel could actually show you like how you can mix and match in our platform, like visual operators, which do things without code right. and then inject code where you think it's necessary. So we give you the complete uh, freedom of it. And so I think it's not either or it's actually both, right? It's just like create a platform which allows you to use no code wherever possible because it's faster, it's easier, it's more accessible. But don't right. take the, the code option away because sometimes it is the better option. And also depending on your skill level, it might be the better option, right? So our answer is clearly both. Yeah, okay. totally agree with that. You know, I think uh, uh, a lot of the power of Einblick actually comes from this sort of fluid interaction between no code and code, right? Like I think hmm. we talked about sort of uh, data science beginners. I think the platform is super well suited for them because they can start out with sort of the no code aspects, but then you know, are not sort of blocked in what they can do because you can always just put code in there as well. Um, and, you know, like I think, you know, SQL or Python are, are good for a lot of things. So, you know, why take that away, right? Why not just mix uh, the best of both worlds to, together in, in one platform? Okay. Yeah, that's super interesting. Also, Mike has a question here. So amazing platform. What is your core audience or most popular industry vertical using your platform? Yeah, good question. Um, so I think core audience is sort of, you know, kind of what we hit on a, a little bit already are sort of, um, you know, folks who are perhaps, um, you know, not day to day programmers. So I would, you know, say like people who are domain experts that are data savvy, but, you know, they're not fluent in Python, uh, but they right. or they just started, you know, uh, on the beginning of their data science journey. Um, so people who, you know, it's not their core job to do data science, uh, but you right. know, uh, they weren't hired to do that. Uh, but they understand that being data driven uh, can improve, uh, you know, the business. And I think in terms of industries, I think we got a lot of uh, early traction with, you know, kind of manufacturing companies, actually, um, mm -hmm. because, you know, a lot of kind of uh, people like, uh, you know, production line managers who are data savvy, but they're not Python programmers, but they know that, you know, building predictive models can help them improve their business, basically. Okay. So, so I hope, like sometimes say like the target users are the ones which have better things to do than code day in, day out. You know, it's just like they, they really know their domain. They are manager of a manufacturing line, for example. That's like one persona we, we have working with Einblick. And there are many, many others, but just like they have better things to do than thinking about a Python notebook the whole day. Um, that said, what we also see quite often is that like people who do data science and really know and like code a lot, they like mm. the platform if they have to collaborate with people from like the, the, the stakeholders essentially on the problem, right? Just like if you need to coordinate, like it's a good platform as well for doing that because you can mix and match particularly the visual aspects with your code aspects. Nobody yeah. wants to sit over a Python notebook and explain to your manager, hey, this is the line of code where I built the model, right? Like it's, it, but if you have this visual environment, it makes this like collaboration aspect and explaining results much, much easier. Yeah, I think that does make a lot of sense in terms of, you know, having everything in one place. It's not only just about coding or it's not only just about visualizing, but you guys have like uh, found that problem. With, I'm sure you have researched a lot. You found that problem and then you've started working on the platform and you bought a fantastic platform, to be honest. Thanks for that question. Mike uh, brings a lot of insights. Uh, so my question is why focus on collaboration, to be honest? Yeah, like so. I in my opinion, like rarely you find a single situation where you have a data problem and you are the only one caring about it. Like solving a real data problem or like doing anything with data normally requires a team, right? So like you have a, a stakeholder who wants to optimize, let's say a manufacturing line, or you want mm -hmm. to optimize your, your ad campaign, like pick your poison, right? Uh, so somebody who cares about the business outcome, 
Then on the other end, you have the people who maybe understand the, the, the techniques, the data science techniques very well, but they care not as much about the business outcome because not everybody can be an expert in like marketing, manufacturing processes, finance, like whatever it is, like the data scientists know the techniques, but they're not experts in the domain, right? And so just by those two personas already need to get together in order to do anything really useful. And then you have like even more people involved, right? Like in the moment something actually works, normally people, more people tend to be interested in the problem, right? And so right. they want to extend it. And so suddenly from like a single idea, maybe a stakeholder cared about, you grew to a team of like 10 people or even more who suddenly are interested in the result. And everybody needs to be aligned and understand the, the underlying assumptions of what, like how you cleaned the data, how you prepared it, what assumptions you made during the whole process. Mm. And this traditional tools, it's essentially only that you share the final outcome, right? Like somebody builds a pretty shard and you share the final thing. Oh yeah, we got 80% accuracy, that's great. But what does it even mean, right? Like, what's it only on a subset yeah, sure. of the data or the whole thing? What features did you use? Is there a chance to improve it even further? And so if you care more about a collaborative process of like getting there rather than just sharing final results, I think this is like really where yeah, I like shines. It's just like they, it really helps you to collaborate during the whole process rather than you just show off the final outcome at the end, which is probably wrong in the, at least the first time or the first few times. Very interesting. What do you think, Emmanuel? Do you have anything to add here? No, I think, you know, Tim kind of hits it on the on the yeah. nail there. Yeah, I agree. Awesome. And uh, also a quick question here, since we were talking obviously about the uh, low code, no code. Amit Deshpande here has a very interesting question. Does no code really mean that users can ask questions in natural language and there is possibility of getting the analytical model results? Yeah, so no, in, in our case, it doesn't mean natural language. In our case, it means just through user interfaces, right? Like okay. by using drag and drop or, you know, uh, kind of, you know, standard uh, UI uh, elements, as opposed to actually writing Python code. Um, mm. That being said, you know, we did some, you know, research at MIT uh, around this kind of idea of, you know, using natural language um, right. to kind of drive uh, charts and so forth. But uh, as the platform is today, uh, it, it means like just UI based instead of code based. Okay, that's that's interesting. Thanks for that, uh, uh, Emmanuel. Also, my question is: Is uh, Nplake the only platform that offers real-time collaboration for data science problems, or are there many more uh, out there? Yeah, no, great question. I think you know, in terms of uh, sort of the general space, uh, I mean, there's a lot of kind of collaborative Python notebooks. Um, you know, Google Colab is an example, or DeepNote, yeah. where you know, you can share a Python notebook and multiple people can, can edit it at the same time. Um, but I think in this kind of very unique way, as you've seen in the, in the quick demo, where it, it has this kind of 2D canvas with multiplayer collaboration and um, where you can also kind of, you know, embed video and audio capabilities um, and sort of re really leverage this kind of whiteboard metaphor together to, to work on stuff. Uh, I think that's very unique. I think we're the only ones uh, doing that. Um, Amazing. You know, took us a lot of years of research to, to get there too. Yeah, exactly. It's not that easy, you know, having like, first of all, having so many features to just one platform. And then uh, I know for a fact that there, there are like, there's a lot of research that has gone behind it. So amazing work. Uh, also, uh, since, you know, interactivity seems to be a very critical part of uh, such projects and also do you require that all the data is stored in Enblick or how does that work? Um, no, actually not. And I think that's really the unique part of our backend is how we deal with that aspect of it. So as you have seen, like in the short demo, like people can come together and work on yeah. this like screen at the same time and see immediate results unfold. Hmm. So just think about you would work with a petabyte of data. Uh, and every operation you do, every visualization you drag out, every AutoML tool you try to like, or, uh, like use over the data there to build a model would take minutes to compute. This, was, okay. this would totally destroy this real-time like, collaboration aspect, right? Because nobody wants to stay at the blank screen and wait for minutes until something happens. Like, if, just think about you as a data scientist, work together, 
with like your manager and you're both staring now on the screen for like two minutes, nothing happens. Probably at some point, somebody would say like, yeah, let's take that offline. Right. So yeah. in contrast to other platforms, interactivity is total key. If you don't have that, like the collaboration aspect would fall apart. And so it took us a long time to figure out on how to achieve that. And our right. solution to that is like, it's an accelerator. So it's a progressive approximation engine, which sits on top of your existing data warehouses, data lakes, or even exactly. just USB files. So you don't change where the data is stored. Rather, what we do is like we connect to your original data source, and then we take a sample of it. And first, we run the computation, what you're doing on the platform, over the sample so that you get a very quick approximate result. And then in the background, we make the sample larger and larger so that over time, the answer gets better and better and more refined. Right? Mm. So the advantage is now, it doesn't matter how big your data is or how complex your operation is, you always get a very quick first approximate response. But if you wait long enough, it, it will eventually converge to the final answer. So you don't have this uncertainty in the long run that everything is approximate. It will converge. Right? But in the beginning, you get something approximate to have the interactivity. And right. we found that users love that because it enables them also particularly to quickly debug for let's like let's assume you built a model and by mistake you have information leakage in there, like a label leaked into oh the data, right? Yeah. So instead of waiting like now minutes or hours until the first model comes back and you detect, detect this mistake, you immediately see it after seconds. Oh shit, I did this wrong here. Let me exclude <laughs> that feature and redo it. Or you can do other feature engineering. So it's an extremely powerful tool. Amazing. This is this is great information, Tim. Thanks for sharing that. Also, we have like a, a very interesting question from audience, uh, a few questions actually. So let's take this one since we were on this topic of low code, no code. Do you feel that the no code option will empower more employees to work with their data? Absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, it's sort of key, right? Like I think learning to be a, a good Python or R or whatever your favorite, you know, kind of data science languages is, is, you know, it's it's tough, right? And I think right. being able to start out with like a, a no code option uh, to begin with and then sort of slowly learn the concepts and kind of bridging more and more deeper into the, the topic of data science, um, I think is a, is a great way to sort of get your data science career or data science journey journey started, I think. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, people will just not jump right into Python, right? Like, I think we need kind of a, uh, an easy on-ramp there. Very true. Also, since we are on this topic, uh, you know, most of the companies, you know, m like many organizations out there are, you know, they're kind of concerned about making the organization data-driven. What do you consider, like, what are the critical steps here to, uh, and what do you think about data-driven as a whole? for companies as well um, yeah i mean you know uh, i think it's a it's a great question i think it's something we observe with what a lot of our enterprise customers and uh, you know i'll let them jump into the details but i think it resonates really well with what we're kind of seeing from from customers yeah like it's a normally like for making an organization more data driven like it's a it's funny that you mentioned it we just did like an article from like mit around particular this this topic and wow. like the, the, the key aspect, I would say, is just like on one hand, you need to educate your employees so that they become more data savvy if you want to drive a data-driven organization, right? Like the, everybody should know something about how to deal with data. And I think like um, this is a general trend. So like if you study now at UC Berkeley, like they require that everybody, or at least they want to get there, that everybody, regardless of the subject, takes a data science proficiency class, right? Mm. And so I think like education is the key thing and companies can do a lot with that. Uh, we, we are actually offering now a, um, like at MIT a no code course over the summer for the professionals. So that like we, because we recognize this need that people want to learn about it. Right? And then there are other aspects. I think like you need to equip the organization with the right tools and you need to change the culture that data driven decisions are the right thing to do. Amazing. This is super insightful. Also, uh, Tim, in terms of uh, 
you know, obviously, I know for a fact when we talk about data driven, then a very important topic that comes up is like the productivity. I'll obviously jump on the productivity. I have like a very interesting question there, but uh, let's take this question from Mike Nash since we are on the platform topic. Really like the drag and drop interface. Does the platform use MLAI internally to learn and give advice on extracting certain insights from data models? How does that work? Um, yeah, no, the, uh, great question too there. Thanks, Mike. Um, so a couple of answers there. I think we have built in operators, you know, I briefly showed this automated machine learning operator uh, when I gave the demo. Uh, we have other ones uh, that help you sort of extract um, insights out of your data automatically. We call this key driver analysis where, you know, you put in a data uh, a set of data and it will tell you like what's interesting about this, this set of data, or you can compare two groups of um, data sets with each other and it will tell you like what makes those interesting. Um, so, you know, pulls out insights automatically. Um, second piece there is like, you know, the, the automated machine learning engine I showed you actually does learn over time and gets better and better. You know, we're using some concepts like, uh, you know, meta learning behind the scenes to, to improve wow. it as you go. So, you know, the more you use it, the, the better it will get. Okay. That's very interesting. So basically, it's like the algo which kind of uh, understands how what type of work we are doing and then it kind of suggests you the best practices according to how you worked on the platform that's how it does yeah uh, the, exactly so the the automated machine learning operator does exactly that right it kind of acts as like a you know a virtual data scientist if you want for for building predictive models right it will pick sort of best practices and you know see if they work on the set of data that you have and if not it will you know try different things and until it finds like a, a good solution there I mean, like, what's also very unique about our automatic tool regarding, like, compared to others, I mean, like, there are many automated machine learning tools out there right now. But I think what really makes it unique is, like, again, our focus on interactivity. So it actually right. figures out what models it should try first because they have a good quality and are fast to train rather than the ones which might need more time, you know, but, like, might provide better mm -hmm. uh, accuracy later on. So for example, like every data scientist kind of knows that like uh, boosted decision trees is like, it's good for a start. And so often what like our automated machine learning tool is actually trying out is boosted decision trees because it learned that those perform very well, particularly if you have the, the features engineered in the right way. And, and then later on, it might try more fancy stuff because then like, yeah, if you wait long enough, it then explores like, other more obscure types of models. Um, we, we actually evaluated as part of the DAPA competition. So DAPA had this AutoML competition. And as long wow. as we were in that competition, we were always ranked first. And then eventually we dropped out because of <laughs> the company. But uh, our AutoML tool is pretty good, particularly for interactivity. It's like probably the only one uh, which does it. This is fantastic. Thanks for that information. Also, uh, to your earlier point, Tim, uh, Saar says a great point, Tim, I believe. So everyone should be trained and training is super critical. So yes, makes a lot of sense. Also, Mike, uh, for you, Tim, great point. Mike, uh, everyone should uh, become data savvy regardless of lo low code, no code. <laughs> Don't worry more about that. So uh, that is super cool also uh since i was supposed to ask around productivity so how did you see productivity gains with n blake i'm kind of curious to learn more about that as well um yeah no happy to chat a little bit about that so you know we did since we're you know academic co-founder team we did a yeah. bunch of uh, sort of academic studies uh, around that uh too so one of our other co-founders here benedetto actually just recently ran a, a study where we invited people who are python experts or Python trained, you know, have many experience in, in using Python. Um, nice. And what we asked them to do is basically run through a data science problem that had sort of multiple subtasks. You know, you can imagine like first start with exploring the data, um, you know, do a little bit of exploratory analysis, then build a machine learning model, do some statistical analysis, uh, yeah. that kind of thing. So we asked them to do that in, in three different sort of sets of tools. Uh, one, like do it in a Python notebook do it in uh, one of the sort of uh, famous or, you know, uh, widely used um, data science workflow tools. And then finally uh, do the same sort of task in, in Einblick. Um, and what we found is that, you know, we saw overall like two to three X, you know, improvements in terms of speeds with Einblick compared to, to Python, for example. Um, even though, you know, these people didn't have any experience with using Einblick before, they just got a one hour training session. So you know, really sort of, 
honing in on the point that I think a lot of simple things, you know, like building visualizations or building, you know, a machine learning model can be done much, much faster uh, with, uh, you know, this kind of no codes uh, built in operators than by having to sort of handwrite something in Python from, from scratch. Okay, that's an interesting story. Thanks for that, Emmanuel. Also, just uh, wanted to let our folks know so no one kind of misses out on the chance to actually use the platform and has, uh, you know, and Blake has given us like an opportunity where we are giving away 75% off on the pro tab. What you need to just do is put in hashtag and Blake in the chat and you'll enter the raffle. So very cool. I want to definitely, uh, you know, check out and see the platform and play around and how it kind of, you know, because I've seen it right now and I know for a fact where uh, it's very cool. I'll try it with, maybe with a friend and we could actually do a project directly on air. So it's amazing. Also, uh, since you were talking about a little about acad academics here, uh, we have a question from Shruti Jain, which is super interesting. How do you apply your teaching skills in your company and Blake? Yeah, so I'll, anyone, yeah. yeah. I'll let Tim take that one. He's the, he's the <laughs> one with the teaching skills. <laughs> I'm not sure what he means with which teaching skills in this sense. Like, so we, what we did in the past, particularly with Imlake, is like we, we used it as a platform to teach people how to do data science. So, like, it, so we have several efforts currently ongoing regarding teaching um, and like education in general. So, on one hand, they are like, courses we are doing. One is like done uh, as part of MIT Professionals Education One. It's a low code uh, course on like data science. And so the idea is for people who have better things to do than coding every day in Python, right. let's explain the concept so that they understand the ideas behind that and then teach them how to use them in a low code environment very quickly for their actual problems they encounter day to day. So that's one uh, thing we are doing. I'm also teaching not only the data science course at MIT as well, so like mm. uh, that one is actually more mixed between code and no code. Again, more focus on concepts. Uh, in the company itself, like we, m many people we have working there, they know the, the tools. So like education in data science comes less up, but we do uh, do like education with other companies we are working with. So not like it's a uh, quite common case that like a company, uh, often like a traditional one approaches us as like, oh, we love this platform. We would like to use it for the following problem. And so right. we then use the platform to work with them on the problem and teach them on the way for solving a particular use case, right? So like they say, we want to predict X, Y, Z based on the data we have. And so they get like consulting time from us in quotation marks, but it's actually nice. what we do is like, not just present them with the final solution so they don't learn anything, Rather, during this process, we have a weekly meeting time with them, or sometimes even more than that, where we show them how to create the solution in the platform. So next time something similar comes around, they know how to do it. And, exactly. and so this is like something we do really, really often with our um, current customers, which then are like not just signing up for the SaaS one, they're more, the, more engaged one, but it, it's a very common theme we are seeing. Okay. Very interesting. Thanks for that, Tim. Also, uh, since we are on this topic, let's take this one from YouTube. And Daksh is asking, does Anne Blake also offer courses or free resources for someone to break into data science? Yeah, so we, we do have a little bit of content on our on our YouTube channel, you know, kind of a common Thanks. data science uh, problems to run into or little mini tutorials. Uh, but we are in the process of actually sort of building out more and more content for that. As Tim has mentioned, he's giving this, you know, course over the summer at MIT. And, you know, some of that material built that we built there will uh, hopefully make it back, you know, kind of open source uh, for everybody to, to look at. So okay. like, I think our uh, main goal there is like I'm, I'm pretty sure we will launch this summer is to create a course which is designed for people who don't want to learn first Python to break into it. <laughs> you know, it's just like really have something for the people who have the problems without yeah. requiring them first to take CS classes. Right? That, that's really the goal here. And I think we can create a very compelling course and we, we already in the process of doing it. So like uh, just sign up at Imblick and we keep you informed like using our newsletters. 
and that also gives a good confidence to those who are kind of uh, want to want to break into data science that it's not only uh, you know you don't have to uh, learn just python to get into this space obviously there are more opportunities and more ways to get into the space obviously python is important though but uh, still you can get into it and do a lot of things yeah, exactly. Right. But I also think like there's a progression, right? Like it, so you can do something without learning entirely Python first. And I think yeah. like learning a programming language and like really getting good at it, it requires a certain mindset, which comes over time, which yeah. can be really frustrating. So if you do like just hello world examples in Python, it's just <laughs> like this is not really goal oriented. You know, it, I think like doing it actually the other way around. Let's start with a low code platform where you can do a lot very, very quickly. And then you learn Python as you walk along. It's just a better approach and you are more productive from day one for the business use cases you have. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Tim. Also, uh, we have a very interesting question from Kate here. Very nice to see Kate joining us. So Kate is asking who is the target user for the tool? Yeah, I mean, we you know we talked a little bit about this before. Yeah. I think you know it's people who do other things than than programming in their day to day job, right? Like you know domain experts uh, for whom data science is, is not their main job. It's not what they hired for, um, but you know they want to learn. They're a little bit data yeah. savvy, uh, and they understand that you know being good at data science or you know using data science as a tool can kind of help them improve uh, uh, their business and, and be more data driven. So you know, kind of. Uh, uh, folks we've talked about a few times, like, you know, domain experts that want to sort of bridge into data science and, and learn more there. Okay. That is amazing. Also, uh, so my question is, again, more on the lines, why, why is it so important for not only data scientists to be the ones building models? What, do you, what are your thoughts there? I think we mentioned it now already a few times. It's just like the domain yeah. experts know yeah. the problem. Right? They are like they really understand the problem they are trying to solve, or the, or they see the opportunities. Mm. They are the ones who understand the data the best. Right? And often, like in order to do anything useful, you really need to know what the data means. Like to give you an example, like we were working with this like car manufacturing together, uh, together, and they are like had all this historical data they wanted to use to predict if something happens in time. Right. And at some point, actually, codes in the data change because they rolled out a new system, right? Yeah. And if you don't know that, like, you cannot build the model in the right way, right? Because you need to account for that fact. And you can only do that if you understand the data deeply, right? And right. so I think it's, like, so important that the like, stakeholders, the domain experts are involved. Ideally, they could do the whole process on their own, just develop the, uh, the model without talking to the data scientists. But I think, like, even if they cannot do that in the beginning and they work with somebody else together, like, it's important that they are involved from day one. And the worst case is actually that you just hand it off to the data science group. They do something, a number mm. comes back, which is an accuracy number, and you have no idea what it means. Right? It's just like, is this as good as it gets? How was the data prepared? Are there any mistakes in it? And it's like so hard to debug that if the persons are not involved during the process. Yeah, makes a lot of sense there. Tim, thanks for that. Uh, also, uh, we've obviously talking about spoken about uh, the past, the present of Andblick. And there's a very super interesting question from Mike here, which will actually take us into the future. So given the increase in the volume of data use cases, and the increasing amount of data tools platforms today. What are your plans for the platform in the future? Very interesting. Yeah, um, no, great question. I think in terms of the increasing amount of data, um, oh, I, that was data tools, sorry. I yeah, know that makes sense. I think um, one of the sort of strengths of Einblick is that we have this sort of built-in, you know, plug-in extension infrastructure. So uh, it's really yeah. easy for people who actually know Python in that case, right? to uh, bring in their own models, own visualization, um, their own, you know, data processing um, routines or wh whatever it might be. So I think, you know, one of the kind of plans we have or goals for the future is to kind of build a little bit of a community of people um, building right. these these uh, plugins and extensions of the platform as a way to kind of, you know, we'll, we'll never be able to cover all the different use cases and so forth. Uh, but I think, you know, that that's a way to kind of get more and more uh, use cases supported by sort of uh, tapping into the, the community. 
Yeah. Okay. There's one other thing which I would ma uh, mention here. It's like so back at MIT and Brown, we did a lot of research into how to protect users from common mistakes. Mm -hmm. And some of them actually went into over the into the platform. So like it's particularly if you start out, like there are a lot of questions here around like how do I break into that field, right? Yeah. If you start out, it's very clear that you make mistakes. Yeah. And some of them are very common. Like for example, like imbalance of labels is a very common mistake you make, and you see it the first time, and next time you know to check for it, right? But sure. like for example, the imbalance of labels case, like the platform can actually recognize these these cases and warn the user about it. They're like, hey, here, be careful, there might be a problem, right? And so we did even more research in that for more complex issues like Simpson paradox, right? Um, and so. One other thing we definitely want to go do more going forward is like put safeguards into the system, which prevent like particularly the novice users to fall into this like common traps, like uh, for multiple hypothesis testing to Simpson paradox. And we did a lot of research already, and some of it is already in the platform, but not all of it. So I think this is another very important direction to go and uh, completely ignored right now in the market. Okay, that's very interesting. Thanks for all the amazing insights here so also uh, wanted to uh, understand when did you, you guys actually you know decide to spin out nblick as a company because i'm sure uh, you know it's it's very difficult when you you like obviously things are kind of out there you know the product is ready you know uh, you've done enough research but now is the time when did you guys actually think about that yeah i mean you know for for me personally i think you know uh, it was sort of the time when we felt that people actually wanted to use the the platform or the prototypes we had back then um, mm. more and more. And it became less about just, you know, uh, writing a research paper or something like that. And nice. we got some pull from like companies to like, oh, this looks really good. Like, you know, what can we do to, to try this out? That kind of thing. Exactly. Um, and then, you know, we went to a couple of like academic conferences and some data science conferences and uh, you know, showed off the, the prototypes there and people always like, oh, this looks amazing. Let me, you know, how can I use this? Uh, and to me, that was sort of the, at least personally, kind of the deciding factor like that. We got a lot of interest from from people actually wanting to use it. And um, instead of, you know, letting it die as an academic pro prototype, it, it made sense to me to try if we can spin it out into a, a company. Okay, that's, that's uh, awesome, Emmanuel. And uh, definitely, when you see the demand, you need to go out and, you know, obviously cover the ground for everyone out there. And that's what you did, which was, I'm sure, an amazing decision. Uh, at least uh, sitting out here and learning more about the platform, I'm super impressed with uh, Einblick and thanks for everything that you do for the community. Also, uh, I know for a fact Mike uh, ha has a follow-up question in the future question, but uh, let's take this one just after we announce our first winner for Handblick. So the time is now. Let's uh, announce the winners. For those who haven't, uh, who have joined us late, just to let you know that uh, Handblick has decided to give 75% off on their pro tires. So if you want to enter the raffle, you just need to type in hashtag Handblick in the chat. So we'll be announcing the second winner towards the end of the show. So here we go. All the best to everyone who are participating. All right, so this is like the cool raffle. Uh, I was about to say this, uh, yeah, suspense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Prashant, congratulations. Uh, so the raffle is still on. We have the entries coming in uh, and we'll be announcing one winner towards the end. Let's take Mike's question here. Uh, excellent answers, love the problem spotting. Following the future question, will the platform explore explainability? That is explainable AI to cover governance. Yeah, and you know, great question. We and we actually do already, right? So um, I showed you this uh, automated machine learning uh, operator that we have in the platform. Um, the models that come back from there, you know, you can um, sort of dive into the uh, sort of explainability of those models already in the in the platform. You know, through yeah. a number of, of different ways, like a uh, you know simple things like looking at feature importance, but then also kind of uh, using the model and you know doing feature uh, or instance based explanations of you know like if it's a I don't know, a credit score model, like it will tell you like, oh, this customer got denied or the model denies this customer uh, particular thing. And this is because X, Y, Z, and it will tell you sort of based on the 
properties of that customer, why, why this has happened. Um, I think there's many more things we can do there and, you know, would love to uh, chat with folks. Uh, Mike, um, if you, you're ha- if you have more follow-up questions, I'm happy to, to chat live about this and kind of see what, what sort of needs are there uh, beyond what we already have in the, in the platform. Yeah, that's amazing. I know for a fact Mike Nash is uh, uh, a, a fantastic advocate out there in the AI space. So would be, I'm sure he'll be very much interested to, uh, you know, chat with you around this. So and th- thanks for that amazing question, Mike. Uh, also, uh, just for our audience, if uh, uh, you know, since we are on this topic, uh, if they want to reach out to you, Emmanuel Tim, what's like the best place uh, to reach out and learn more about and like. Uh, about the platform and anything else as well? I mean, multiple different ways, right? Like uh, uh, going through the website, email, Twitter, um, you know, okay. find me on LinkedIn, connect, request me. I'm happy to chat with everybody. I'm sure Tim is the same. So, same, you know, same here. Just like, shoot me <laughs> email, just like uh, try to keep it simple. And, you know, yeah. it, you know it's, a, it's a great point. You know, really, you know, at the end of the day, we're so early on in our journey as a company and as a product, right? So, um, yeah. The more we can learn from users, uh, you know, how they like the product, how they want to use it, what's missing and so forth, uh, the better. So, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll definitely be happy to chat with uh, with everybody. That, uh, exactly. Is I think feedback kind of makes it more important for, uh, you know, for the product to get better. And uh, it takes you to another level as well and keeps you always challenged rather than just <laughs> with exactly. no feedback. So. It's always great. Uh, also, it's time for us, uh, a good opportunity for everyone who was sitting in there to put in hashtag Iron Blake and let's do the second draw. All the best to everyone who participated. Let's do this. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> awesome. All right. Let's see who the winner is. Shubham Rane. Shubham, congratulations. Prashant, congratulations. Feel free to reach out to me and anyone from the Endblake team will be happy to help you with a discount code. And uh, uh, this was amazing, Emmanuel, Tim. I don't feel like, obviously, <laughs> I have so many more questions, but because of the time constraint, obviously, uh, we'll plan a 2.0 session where we'll talk more around uh, the platform, about Endblake, about uh, the future of data, and we'll definitely have a data-driven session separately. That is what I see. I know for a fact that you guys can talk a lot around it. And since you closely work with data-driven organizations, so it's always good to uh, obviously get those insights. Uh, and thank you again for visiting the Ravid Show. Yeah, no, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks a lot for, for having us. Uh, it was great. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us and asking these amazing questions. Thanks and congratulations to the winners. Thank you.